Hi everybody, I'm Marissa Frosch from Raven's Quill Publishing and this is the Amphibian Press Podcast. Today I'm here with Valerie Francis. Hi Valerie. Hello Marissa, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm best kind, thank you. Awesome. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself to get started? Yeah, uh, I'm from Canada. I'm an author of Love Stories for Busy Women, um, but I'm also a literary editor. I'm a certified story grid editor. That's awesome. I love the story grid and all of its editors. Everybody's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, when I went to your website, the first thing I noticed was this Masquerade Part 1, which is a novel in 12 parts. I love that idea. I do something similar in my fiction. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about Part 1 and how you ended up breaking it into parts? Well, the idea for the parts came to me because I was sitting around one night chatting with my friends who all love to read, but they all were at the point of their life where they were really busy with kids or their career or with aging parents or for one reason or another, they weren't reading as much as they used to and they really missed it. And one of the women said for her, even in the, she had a book on her coffee table that she'd been trying to get to for months it was too much of a commitment. It looked like work. So I said, well, what if you had a book that was broken up into parts for you, that they're small enough that you could read it on your cell phone when you're sitting in the car waiting for a kid to get out of rehearsal or you're in the doctor's office or you're commuting home or you just want on Friday evening to sit back with a glass of wine and have nobody touch you <laughs> nobody talked to you and you just want to space out for 15 20 25 minutes how does that sound and they said oh if you could write that we're all in so that's how it started so i took my story and it's in 12 parts because it takes place over a calendar year so each part is a month and it's called masquerade because it starts with a masquerade ball in october so the, the concept behind it is you've got these two people, Isla and Colin, they go to a masquerade ball and they meet and of course their faces are masks, masked. And they're given an opportunity at the end of the ball, they can meet together, meet once a month, every month for a year, in secret with no consequences provided they follow a couple of rules. And of course, you know, as soon as there's a couple of rules, then our hero and heroine are in trouble, right? Yes. <laughs> They're gonna start breaking them. Uh, and of course they do, which is not really a, um, a giveaway. You, you kind of know that's gonna happen. And Colin and Isla, both in their lives, they, they have stuff going on, right? Their they're marriage, Colin is actually married. Um, so his marriage is, you know, should have ended years ago. She is in the process of a divorce. She's a very busy career woman. She doesn't really want another relationship, but this idea of just sort of a little getaway once a month, somebody else's dime with no consequences sounds really enticing for both of them. So that is the premise. And of course, each month is another rendezvous. That's awesome. So the reason that I do the, the parts in my books too is the same reason because I had kids and I just couldn't I just couldn't I didn't have time to read anymore and it was awful so I love that you're doing this and I am so excited to share you with all my busy mom friends <laughs> <laughs> it's a little spicy so if you like a little spice then this is the book for you <laughs> yeah it definitely sounds a little spicy um, yeah, I'm excited. I, I signed up for the first part, so I'll let you know what I think. Is yes. it on? It's on um, Amazon, right? I can review it. Mm -hmm. Yep, awesome. Amazon, Kobo, all the usual places. Awesome. Uh, so, in addition to writing women's fiction for busy women, uh, you also have this really awesome book club. Yes, I have been toying with the idea of a book club for a few years and I couldn't figure out how to make it work. And I'm doing um, a podcast right now with Tim Grawl, a book launch show, and that's all about marketing, book marketing and marketing for authors. Mm -hmm. And in one of the podcasts, we were coming up with a way to build a relationship with subscribers and with readers, because that's really important to me. You know, I want to get to know who's reading my books and, and what they love to read, and I want to 
be able to chat with them. So through the course of that conversation, I, I came up with a way to make the book club idea work. So it's once a month right now. It's um, if you if you sign up to the book club on the first of the month, I'll send out an email with um, a book recommendation. And there's a lot of book clubs, right? Mm -hmm. And what a lot of people don't realize, and it you know it may or may not even be important, but a lot of people don't realize that the book placements in a lot of commercial book clubs are paid placements. And that's fine. I completely understand that business model. I have no problem with it whatsoever. But for me, it's really important that the books I recommend, they're all books by women, for women, about women, because of course I write, that's the type of stuff I write. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to have read the book and honestly want to recommend it to somebody. So my rating is, you know, wine glasses, <laughs> it's not stars. So how many wine glasses out of five are they gonna get? And the one that um, I put out for this month is Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine by Gail Honeyman. And I gave her um, five wine glasses out of five because I just think the book is brilliant. It, I would have given it four and then upon reflection, I thought, no, she's got really, she's got some really good stuff in there that from a craft point of view is not easy to pull off. Like Eleanor as a protagonist is a little hard to get to know at the beginning. She's not immediately likable. And that kind of goes against conventional wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. So as a writer, I'm also looking at these, when I'm recommending books, I'm looking at them as a writer and as a reader, because I, I can't seem to separate those hats anymore. So when I looked at Eleanor Oliphant, and I saw the types of things that Gail was doing with Eleanor, I could appreciate how hard that was to pull off and how clever she was to create a character that was hard to like initially, because that's Eleanor's whole problem. There's really nothing wrong with her. She just doesn't quite fit in society. She's not a bad person. She's not evil. She's not mean. She doesn't backbite. There's none of that stuff going on. She just doesn't quite fit in with her coworkers or in with general society. And no one quite knows how to interact with her or what to do with her. And so as a result, they kind of push her aside and forget about her. So the experience that we have as readers of Eleanor in those first couple of chapters is exactly what Eleanor is facing in her life. Mm. So we kind of realize, oh, we're doing to her what everyone else is doing to her. And but the difference is, we get to follow her around in her private life and her coworkers don't get to do that and her neighbors don't get to do that. So we get to see the private Eleanor and before you know it, you're completely hooked. And I would catch myself, I read a lot of books as you can imagine, but this is the book that my mind kept going back to and I'd think, how's Eleanor doing? I wonder, and I'm gonna go back and read another little bit. And I didn't want to read it too quickly because I didn't want the story to be over too quickly. So that's the kind of thing I do in my book club. Um, so I, I give a little review, my opinion of the book. I try to put in a little clip of an interview with the author. And I also review the audio book because people are busy and my readers are really busy. For some reason, there's this feeling that if you're listening to an audio book, it doesn't really count. It's not like reading. It totally counts. It totally counts. Listen to the audio books. It's all cool. It's all fine. But I'm really picky with audio books. And it's tricky because it's more of a collaborative art. You've got to have a great novel, but then you've got to have a novel that translates well into spoken language. And you've got to have a really great performer performing your words. So even though the novel may be great, the narrator, when the narrator is reading, they're reading like this. And after a while, you're lulled to sleep. <laughs> so a lot of it is like that, where my preference for an audiobook is someone who's acting the words. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and I, I don't have wine glass rating. I just sort of have a happy face or a sad face or a neutral face. You know, it's either, because audiobooks for me, they either work or they don't. Mm -hmm. Spend your Audible credit or your Kobo credit or save it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? Um, 
Yeah, so that's the kind of thing I do with my book club. And so far, people are really liking it. And one of my favorite things is that people reply and they share their favorite book with me or a favorite author they have with me, which means I get to explore and discover new writers as well. So it's creating a dialogue and it's a lot of fun. I, I genuinely enjoy it. Awesome. Yeah, I, I just opened the first one. I just signed up. So I just opened that um, Ophelia one today. So I'm pretty excited to be part of it. <laughs> Let me know what you think. Let me know, know if you like Eleanor Elephant. I will. I'm pretty, yeah, that's, it's on my list. I have to finish the, um, the story grid homework. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then I'm jumping into women's fiction. That's going to be my first um, deep dive that I wouldn't normally do. So, yes. so this book club is kind of perfect <gasps> for me. <laughs> Um, it absolutely is. So with Story Grid, you get to do a lot of cool things, including these Story Grid guides. Mm-hmm. And you chose Bram Stoker's Dracula. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, that's actually coming out in October. Nice. For Halloween. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's really funny. I did my certification in 2017. And this, of course, is when we were first hearing about the guides. And I was so overwhelmed with what needed to be, with what I was trying to learn. I mean, we just came back from Nashville for the second certification. So you know what I'm talking about when I say that's a little overwhelming. Um, So I had said to myself there in the room when Sean was explaining about the guides, don't pick a book right now, Valerie, don't pick a book right now. Your, Your brain is too full. But for some reason, Dracula popped in my head. Now I've read, I had read Dracula before in university but I hadn't read it since. Um, why that popped in my head, I have no idea. But when it popped in my head, I said, okay, don't, don't decide now. Like, write it down, and when you get home, calm down, then make a decision. Got back in my hotel room that night, brainstorming a list. Dracula kept coming up, and it was like, it was like I was being nagged, right? Like, it was like there was something there that was bugging me. So I wrote Dracula down, and I had a question about the guides, I don't remember what it was now. But the next day when I went into the, to the training session, I asked Sean my question. And he said, well, say for example, you wanted to do, oh, I don't know, Dracula. <laughs> I said, oh, that's three times, the cosmos in the last 24 hours has given me Dracula three times, I guess I'm doing Dracula. So that's what I did. I got home and I sat down and analyzed Dracula from, it's the full story grid workup. So for anyone listening, if you're familiar with story grid, it is an editing method um, developed by Sean Coyne. And it's like the pride and prejudice analysis that he did. So there's an introduction which goes over the genre, which in Dracula's case is horror because it's a, it's a pillar of the, of the genre. So I go over the obligatory scenes and conventions and everything that makes a horror story a horror story. Then I go through the novel scene by scene and I analyze each scene according to literal literal and essential action, um, the five commandments and any interesting tidbits uh, that's in there. So I do that for the whole novel. Then of course, there's the usual story grid tools. There's the spreadsheet, the full scap, um, the, the, yeah, the spreadsheet, the foolscap, and the actual grid. So, uh, so it's a, a bit of work, but it's it's fascinating to study classics or to study master works, which you know may or may not be a classic. And I think that is the kind of thing that, no matter what genre you write in, it's the kind of thing that a serious writer really needs to do because you learn so much from that analysis what works and what doesn't work. And you learn a lot from each of those. I mean, you know, there's some stuff in in Dracula that doesn't work so well. Um, Is Bram Stoker concerned that I'm saying that it doesn't work so well? No, his (laughs) ghost is in this room right now. He's like, all right, kid, let's see who's reading your book in a hundred years. And you know, then we'll just, we'll talk about it. Um, So that's not to say that Dracula is a terrible book and it needs to be tossed out. Not at all, not at all. There's a lot of really good stuff in there. I mean, that's why it's still around, right? That's why people are still reading it and why Dracula has made its way into popular culture. But the stuff in there that doesn't work is really interesting to see why it's not working. And and it doesn't matter what genre you write in. 
Mm -hmm. at all. You don't have to be a horror writer to to appreciate the craft behind it and to learn how we can do certain things better or what worked and what didn't work and why it didn't work. Um, so even though it's a horror novel, um, it's, you know, it's a Victorian horror novel. It's not, it's, it's a little different than a modern <laughs> horror. It's a little different than The Shining, <laughs> put it <Yeah>. that way. <laughs> um, so, or, or Bird Box. Right, it's, it's different than that, but um, wonderfully creepy at the same time. <laughs> That's awesome. So, you said that there are things that didn't work, and that kind of is that what spurned the idea for your. Uh, hold on, your thriller. Yeah, yes. I did. It is, it's, I, I want to make sure you put it as a thriller. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's really interesting because we had three months to, to do these analysis. And a Dracula is a hard book to do out of the gate. It's a very long book. The, you know, the average full length novel today is about 80,000 words ish. Dracula is 120. Um, it's epistolary, which means it's got notebooks and journal entries and all kinds of different stuff in it, telegrams and whatnot. So the scenes are a little hard to find. Anyway, it took me the full three months and I was really tired <laughs> at the end of it. And so I'm sending this material to Sean Coyne and in my email to him, I said, okay, either I have discovered something here or I've totally misunderstood your methodology, in which case you're, you'll cry into your coffee and wonder where did I go wrong? <laughs> I said, and if, if you agree with me that there's things in Dracula that don't work so well, I think we have an opportunity here to rewrite them according to story grid principles to see, to see if we can do something more with the book. So I got his attention um, and he called me and said, all right, this can't just be a rewrite of Dracula because that's an academic exercise. And there is value in an academic exercise, but there may not be a lot of commercial return <laughs> in an academic exercise. And it's a big project, right? It's a couple of years of your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why, this is why I love working with him because he's got so many years experience and a whole different point of view on this industry than I have with my four years experience. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I said I would love to see with Dracula is to turn it into a thriller. So for those who follow the story grid methodology, you'll already know this, but for those who don't, I'll just say it anyway. A thriller is a combination of an action story, a crime story, and a horror story. And which one of those three takes precedence is, is really up to the writer. It's an artistic choice. But the three are not usually um, equally prevalent. So the question I had to ask myself is, am I writing a thrilling horror novel or a horrifying thriller. And there's a huge difference, although it doesn't sound like it when I explain it that way. And the main difference is the villain, to boil it down to its essentials. In a horror story, the villain, the force of antagonism, is a monster. You know it's not real. You know it doesn't exist. Um, um, Freddy Krueger does not exist. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Vampires don't actually exist. So you can go into the story and enjoy the, the scare and the, the ride. Then you can close the book and go into the world and you're fine. In a thriller, the villain is real. Right? Like in Silence of the Lambs, it's a serial killer thriller. There are serial killers, sadly. Um, Buffalo Bill is terrifying. The sewing the suit scene gets me every time. Like I can tell I'm coming up to it. It's like, because blah, blah, blah. Um, that's that's scary. Just to, um, to further your point, he's also based on a real serial killer. See, there you go. <laughs> right? Yeah. <sighs> um, girl on a train. That could, you know, there's lots of Rachel Watsons out there. Mm hmm. Uh, male and female versions. Um, so that's, that's the primary difference between, for, for the purposes of this conversation, between a thriller and a horror. So I said, Sean, Dracula is such an amazing villain. I think he's 
the best, if not, you know, one of the best, if not the best villain in English literature. But if you make him just a monster that you can't reason with and who's just like Jaws is a monster. Mm -hmm. Jaws is, has nothing against the people of the community. He's just looking for lunch, right? Mm -hmm. right. Zombies are doing what zombies do. Mm -hmm. Vampires are doing what vampires do. I said, what if we ramped up the vampire and made him not just a two dimensional monster, but a creature that could actually exist? To me, then it gets way more chilling. Now, for anyone who has read Dracula, they, they may agree with me that the whole idea of a vampire as um, the hero of a love story is really unsettling because Dracula is horrible. Um, he, he is a, a corpse. He exists to feed off of others. Um, and he represents the the language. Huh, I'm I'm struggling here with the language between how Victorian culture represented this and how our modern culture represented this. Okay, so when you think about when Bram Stoker was writing Dracula, um, homosexuality was a sin. There is some biographers think that Bram Stoker was struggling with this himself. And so Dracula is a manifestation of what he considered was a sin. So this is one of the reasons why it's such a dark book. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of sexual assault in there and everything. So when you take a vampire and make him into a love interest, it's like, uh, I don't, I don't know. You know, but then again, you know, Fifty Shades was a huge hit. And that's kind of in the same vein, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's people who really love that. Um, but you wouldn't say, you wouldn't take someone like Buffalo Bill or Hannibal Lecter and turn them into a love interest. Right. Right. So the character that I'm creating is more, he's not a serial killer, but he's more like that. He's a real uh, a real villain, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's the what I'm working on. That's my thriller, inspired by Stoker's work, and certainly will include rewritten portions of Stoker's work because it's public domain. So that gives me lots of freedom there. But that's not the main story. That's the story within my story. So are you setting this back when Dracula took place, or are you setting it now? Modern day. Modern day. Awesome. Yep. I'm really excited. Vampires <laughs> don't die, right? Right. So he's still around. <laughs> oh, cool. That's so cool. <laughs> well, and in addition, we're still finding manuscripts from Bram Stoker. And one of his relatives is actually Canadian, which is kind of cool. And the... Oh, I'm trying to remember the year. I think it was in the 80s. I can't remember exactly. But there was... Um, when, when I studied Dracula in university, I did it because I wanted to take a course with Dr. Elizabeth Miller because she was just the coolest prof on campus. She's also one of the leading experts on Dracula. Mm -hmm. And in the 80s, uh, I think it was the museum in Philadelphia who discovered a box of papers that were uncatalogued, that were Dracula, that were Bram Stoker's notes on Dracula. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine? Like a hundred years after it was published. So those are now available in book form, and I, I have a copy of those. Stoker's handwriting is awful. Um, <laughs> it, it's just, it's something else. And um, a couple of years ago, one of his uh, family members discovered in a box of uh, memorabilia that's been handed down generation to generation. In it was one of Bram Stoker's notebooks, right? So we are still discovering stuff from Bram Stoker that are sort of starting to fill in the puzzle for us as to how he came up with this idea, what, what he was thinking, where, um, where certain ideas in the book came from. Um, so that's, that's an element of it too. So bringing it into modern day is not a huge stretch at all. Awesome, that's so exciting. Such a cool idea. 
yeah, well, let's see if I can pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you can. I am giving it everything I got. <laughs> you can do this. I have faith in you. <laughs> All right. So um, is there anything else you want to tell listeners? Well, if they want to find out anything about me, they can come to my website, ValerieFrancis.ca. Everything is there. Uh, they can download the first part of Masquerade for free. They can join um, the book club, of course, um, which will, so every, the first of every month, they'll get another one of my recommendations. If they want to, um, if you're a writer and you want to find out about book marketing, the link to the Book Launch Show podcast is on my site. And I'm also on a podcast um, called the Story Grid Editor Roundtable Podcast. It's a mouthful. Uh, and there's, I'm one of five certified Story Grid editors, and we analyze a film every week according to Sean Coyne's methodology. So the link to that is on the website as well. So lots of things to do. Make sure you check out her website. That was ValerieFrancis.ca, and I'll have a link in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Valerie. You're very welcome, Marissa. It was fun.